I'm here with Brian Wilson on Timothy White's Rock Stars, and we're in Ground Control Studios in Santa Monica, California, the site of so much recording for Brian's solo record. And I'd like to talk to Brian now about the first single from Brian Wilson. Brian, how would you describe the first single, Love and Mercy, to someone who hasn't heard the song yet? Well, it's not a real typically Brian Wilson kind of a song, you know. The background voices are sort of Beach Boy-ish, you know what I mean? It hints to the Beach Boy sound, but it's me doing all the parts. But there is something I'm wondering about right out of the box. It's taken so long for you to get around to a solo album, Brian. Why is that? Well, when we first started out, I said, I, I want to make this album. But I said, if we can go at my pace, because I was afraid, you know. I was afraid that if I, did, if I went too fast, I wouldn't be able to get the album done. Now, I'm scared of sticking my neck out and putting a record out that might get criticism from people, you know what I mean? I'm very afraid of that. I'm, I'm very, very afraid of the critics and what they say about my music. People junk their, their albums because they can't finish them, you know? They, they, they go unfinished. But we're not going to do that. We're following through beautifully. You've got a bunch of um, guest star collaborators, songwriting-wise, on the new album. I know Jeff Lynne of ELL fame and wrote a song with you called Let It Shine. Yes. How did that come about? Uh, he made a call and said that he was interested in working with me and that he had a song that we could possibly work, change around, or, you know, he, he said he was open for anything. So, so it came to be that uh, we worked together, and uh, sure enough, it was like a smash. Uh, I mean, it, was, it, it worked out great. What was it like working with Jeff Lynn? Yeah, a little tense, a little tense. He tends, he wears shades, like, at, at night, you know. <laughs> he wears shades all the time. I think they're pres prescription shades. And he'll be in a, in a room at night with shades on, and you can't see his eyes, right? So I got into a habit of just sort of looking kind of at him, but not in his eyes, you know. But uh, it was a spectacular collaboration. We really did well together. The first solo record you ever did back in 1966, uh, Caroline No was oh, a love song. that's one of my very favorites. What was the, uh, the character in the song trying to say uh, to Caroline? It was a story about how once you run your gamut with a chick, there's no way to get it back. It's like it's dead. It's dead meat. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like there, you gotta you gotta call a turkey a turkey if it's a turkey, right? Right. And it takes a lot of courage to do that sometimes, you know, in your life. So that's just a story about how you know it's a very pretty love song about how this guy uh, and this girl lost it, and and there's no way to get it back. It was like a sad song. It's a sad thing. It being your first solo record, what made you decide to uh, put a, a single out just under the Brian Wilson name, not with the Beach Boys? Oh, I thought maybe that I could get a single going. You know, I've, I've always used the word spiritual in my life, in my career. When you really analyze things, the Beach Boys are kind of like a spiritual group, you know, with the, the harmonies and, you know, the, the mellow instruments, you know, and everything. It just, it all adds up to the word spiritual, spiritual for me. And I thought maybe if I released a, a song under my name, that it would be a spiritual release and I'd have a hit. Caroline No, the 1966 hit that later appeared on the Beach Boys Pet Sounds album. And, by the way, it was the first song ever issued under Brian Wilson's name. This is probably the best album I've done since, since Pet Sounds, and, and hopefully, you know, it'll uh, get off the ground and sell for me. I'm glad you feel that confident about it, because I feel the same way. Let me ask something about Pet Sounds, just to go back through history a little bit. A lot of people may not realize that Pet Sounds was meant to be your pet sounds, meaning your favorite sounds, melodically and vocally pulled together in one place, right? Yeah. As a matter of fact, the title Pet Sounds came from Mike Love. He thought of that title for the album. He just drops on me one day. He said, what, about, what if we called the album Pet Sounds? And I said, that's a great title, you know? And uh, we went down to San Diego and took the, took the uh, album cover uh, photograph with some lambs and goats. I think they were goats. We were feeding the goats uh, uh, some apples, some pieces of apples. In the San Diego Zoo? Yeah, in the San Diego Zoo, yeah. <laughs> I know that there's a new uh, CD version of Pet Sounds coming out. I feel that it's, an, that it's an important release for the Beach Boys because Pet Sounds is, a, is an historic album in the music business, and I feel that the, the release of Pet Sounds would symbolize what I call a spiritual move, you know. It's a spiritual thing to release a record in, in the first place, let alone Pet Sounds. The Beatles were very influenced by Pet Sounds, weren't they? No, they weren't influenced by it at all. Oh, yes, oh, no. They were inspired. It yeah. was a competitive thing. They wanted to make a better album than Pet Sounds, so they went and they did it, right? 
they uh, they they surpassed our songwriting abilities, you know. So they they deserve credit. Some of the vocals on the new album are some of the best that you've done since, uh, say, "Don't Worry, Baby" and yeah, yeah. "Caroline No." Yeah. Like "Melt Away," a track on the new album. Those are wonderful vocals. How did you build up, say, the vocal parts in a, a song like "Melt Away," which also has that nice bittersweet quality to it? Yeah. Well, I, I build it up off the pretense that it should enhance the melody. You know, not just something going on by itself that doesn't does, that has nothing to do with what's going on in the melody. It wasn't a belabored thing where I sat down and said, oh, God, I, I'm pulling my hair out of my head because I can't think of these parts. It wasn't like that at all. It just came out spontaneous. Brian, I'd like to go back into your personal background a little bit and talk about a place that you hung out in your teenage years, a place called LaShawn's Record Shop on Imperial Highway in Hawthorne, California, where the time spent there became a pivotal involvement in terms of your career. It was a, uh, a record store. It wasn't a real big record store, but it had one... Uh, record booth where you could go in and shut the door and there was a window on the door so you could see out, you know. And uh, people were allowed to take demonstration records and take them in there and play them. And, if, and then if they liked them, they could, they'd buy them, you know. But, but it really stimulated, stimulated a lot of business, you know what I mean? So I went there and I, I can't remember who I played. I, I know I sampled something. I can't remember just what, what it was. Four freshmen, maybe? Maybe the or? freshman. I think it might have been the freshman, the four freshmen, yeah. It was a, uh, an attempt on my part to try to relate to music, you know what I mean? And, like, the only way I could relate to it was by immersing myself in the music. At first, I thought I might have been a little scared of the four freshmen, only because they were very awesome and their harmonies were beautiful. I think I have something here with this group, the four freshmen. I thought to myself, as a matter of fact, I know I have some, I'm onto something here with this group, you know? So I took lessons for four years, I guess four years, uh, from their harmonies. I would, I would dissect every note of their harmonies and, 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 and transpose it over to my piano so that I could play each one of those songs from start to finish, absolutely to the exact note. Right. You know what I mean? The arrangements I could copy. I learned, in other words, I discovered at, at an early, at age 14, that I could actually dissect modern harmony. What happened was I learned to concentrate on music that way so that when the Beach Boys happened, uh, developed in my life, I had the knack of making harmonies. And I, and I applied it to the Beach Boys, and sure enough, we actually got going. What was the first song you ever wrote? The very first Surfer one. Surfer Girl was my first song. What were the circumstances? Uh, I was in my car, uh -huh. and I was alone, and I just started humming a melody, and uh, spontaneously. And then, and then I drove back to my house, and I, and I went to the piano, and, I, and, and then I finished out the song. I finished the whole song. I wrote the bridge and the, and the uh, lyrics also, all in one day. Brian, I want to ask you about another recent release of yours, not as mainstream as your new solo album, but it's a record that you did in tribute to another product besides the Beach Boys of your hometown of Hawthorne, California, and that's the Barbie doll. Could you tell us how you came to be approached by Mattel Toys to record the song Living Doll? We got uh, the word that uh, the uh, company, the Mattel Toys Company, wanted me or the Beach Boys. I guess they asked for the Beach Boys first, but they didn't get them. The Beach Boys turned it down. They didn't want to work on it. And so I did all the parts and did the whole thing myself. Barbie used to be a song called Christine. First I had a song called Christine. Then I took, I took the melody to Christine and, and put new lyrics to the melody, and that's Barbie. Brian, I want to ask you about all the car songs that the Beach Boys have done over the years. Did you have a favorite car of your own? Yeah, my favorite car was a 57 Ford Fairlane. I always loved that car. I thought it was the greatest car in the world. Did you buy it yourself? No, or? my dad bought it for me. For graduation, birthday? For Christmas. Oh, really? Yeah. Was that a surprise? I, I flipped out. I went, oh, no, a car, a new car. I flipped out. Yeah, I really did. Do you get a kick looking back at the car uh, records that you wrote as well, wrote with Roger Christian? And oh, Bayer yeah, so? well, Roger Christian came up with, like, a, a basic format for me to follow uh, lyrically, and then I'd take it home and I'd write melody to lyric. But usually I'll write lyrics to a melody, but in his case I had to, had to do it backwards. So it took me longer to get the song written, but it, but it was worth it because he wrote great lyrics. Was there a certain song that you did together that uh, that you still like a lot? Yeah, a little too. If I was to pick a classic Brian Wilson record from the past, uh, a favorite of mine for years has been uh, "Don't Worry, Baby." Oh, thank you. That made that made my whole day right there. You just made my day. You know that, Timothy? I was thinking about what could I do to make people feel loved. You know, you've heard of Flower Power, right? Right. And the love generation in the whole in the in, in the mid '60s. Right. Well. 
we we came along a little earlier than but well, we, we we did don't worry baby in 1964 right i don't know i mean maybe it's a dead issue i don't think this matters very much but we tried our best to bring out a love in our music for people and for just anybody just anyone or anything and sure enough we did it, it actually worked we actually I know that there's another side to the Beach Boys, more whimsical and fun-loving, as typified by Barbara Ann. As a matter of fact, we were all laughing when we cut that record. Dean Torrance from Jan and Dean was, came by the studio one night when we were recording Barbara Ann. So Carl, or Mike said, hey, why don't you double with Brian? Hey, that's a great idea, you know? So he doubled with me, and, and it made a sound. We, our two voices together kind of made a sound. Sure enough, Barbara Ann went to number one in the country. Now, what was all the laughter uh, in the studio? What, we were doing it because by? Barbara Ann was part of a party album they were doing. Right. See, Mike Love was finally in a good mood. You know, he was laughing, and he was, like, relaxing and singing and clapping, and everybody was kind of, like, tapping on. Uh, like, I, I took a... I took some metal thing and, and was beating on and, and was making a drum beat on an ashtray, you know, on, on, on a big tin ashtray, you know. And we were all just kind of letting it all hang out, you know. That was that's like one of the high points of our, of our whole career. Brian, I know that there came a midpoint in your career when you needed to top yourself and the pressure was increasing. And you decided to work on a track called Good Vibrations. What were you going for in that track? The best pop record ever produced. I, I, I was actually going for... Uh, the best record of that year, anyway. You know what I mean? I was determined to do something like that. I was I was pulling my hair out of my head, thinking to myself, I'm sitting around watching Phil Spector completely demolish the music business with his records, and here I am with all this talent and ability, and I and I'm not doing anything about it. You know? I thought I said, let me let's get off my I'm going to get off my ass here and do a good record. You know? And sure enough, we did it. I mean, you know, that's another thing. You know, I never read that book by Norman Vincent Peale. You know, the power of positive yeah, thinking? Yeah, but I read the title. You know what I mean? I read the title of that book, and I put it to work when I when I did Good Vibrations, you know. I really surprised myself. I said, you know, gee, do, you, do I really think I can make a record that great? And I said, you damn know I can. And I, I would argue with myself, you know. That's how it always is. I always, I've always been that way, and I always will be that way. Where did you find the theremin for Good Vibrations? I mean, We got it from the, from the union. I called up the union, and I said, do you have a theremin player? And they said, yes, we do. And I, say, and I said, what is his name? And they said, Paul Tanner. I said, well, please send Paul Tanner to Columbia Recording Studios on Gower and Sunset Boulevard or, or wherever it was. He came down there, and I said, let me see that. And I said, let me hear it for a minute. You know, he played, I went, exactly what I want. That's exactly the instrument that I wanted, a theremin. It, 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 went in, it didn't go in half steps. It went, it graduated. You know what I mean? Right. Like a siren. That, yeah. So we did that, and we put it on, and it was great. What do you think the next breakthrough was? after Good Vibrations. What do you think the best record you did after Good Vibrations was? I think Do It Again. Do It Again? Yeah. Also, we were talking about the sort of garage band scene in, uh, in Hawthorne and the, the South Bay area and different bands that came through. You're talking about a band called the Frogmen from Lennox High that had an influence on you. They had a certain song called Underwater. Uh, yeah, that... a group called the Frogmen. They had a little bit of an influence on me, yeah. As I think of it, they had a very large influence on my, on my brain. It was helpful in terms of coming up with a song of your own? Yeah, uh, called Do It Again. Right. Because the, the, the part went... You know, which which was very much like my uh, Do It Again riff. I, I, I love that pumping beginning. I love that, uh, that real kind of energetic sound at the beginning. Yeah, that, you know what that was? No. That was a drum. That oh, was, really? That was a snare drum with a, an extremely a lot of beats of uh, delay beats per second you know what i mean when you hit the drum it went <clears throat> like that uh it was a very special technique that i've never heard on a record ever after that Does a record have to be a hit in your mind uh, to be successful? To, yeah, to be successful, for yes. you to feel good about it. The only way you can really be proud of yourself is if you really can get some return from it. Like, say, you made a little bit of money from sales of it, and you had uh, some kind of acclaim. Somebody said, "Hey, I like that record," you know, or you had you had some feedback from somebody. Not so much that it would sell that much, but you would get some good feedback. Somebody say, "Hey, good one, guys. Beach Boys, good, good Beach Boys, good record." I had a hell of a time getting through some of the some of the. Uh, frustrations that go along with being a successful recording artist. The old Red Belly classic, Goodnight Irene. That goes back to the 30s. 
I had the notion that I could arrange it, but I, I really wasn't sure how to approach it because it was such a simplistic tune, you know? Hmm. It was just really... Doo, 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 doo. You know, a real simple folk song, right? So there's only so much you can do with that many notes. There, there's just a few notes in the melody, right? I did a thing where you could listen to it once and then listen to it again and not get tired of it. Good night, Irene. Part of a forthcoming project for the Smithsonian. Brian, we've been talking about the pain and sometimes the pressure of being a Beach Boy. Now I'd like to move on to your need for independence in the here and now, and also the attitudes that underline that. For instance, your relationships with other Beach Boys like Carl Wilson and Mike Love. Mike Love can actually be almost what you would call a young gangster. You know what I mean? He has a lot of mind muscle, and he and he he like really muscles me to get to get records cut and everything, you know. And I get I get I just get fed up with it with with some of that kind of stuff, you know. I mean, I hey, I'll make a record when I'm when I'm inspired to make one. You'll make one now or whatever, you know what I mean? It's just he he's that way. But little does he know my total creative uh, capacity. It's two people blind to each other, you know what I mean? He like does not understand me, and I don't understand him. Although we for some reason we stay together as a group. But as people, we're, very, we're a far cry from friends. You know? mm. It's really quite, quite difficult to, to, to live in the same world with the Beach Boys, with the other Beach Boys, you know? I mean, I, find it, I'm not, I don't make any lies about that. I don't care who's listening as far as... If you, want the, if you really want the truth from Brian Wilson, then you're going to have to take it like it is, you know? Right. Well, family is always complex anyhow. I'd rather take my brother and say, like, look, look, go have your life. Go, go have your own life. So on. I'll meet you in the studio, or, or, and I'll see you on the road. Now, I don't say that to him, though, but in my heart, that's what I'm saying to him, you know? You know, instead, when I see him, I say, hi, Carl. Oh, hi, Brian. And that's it. I mean, that's the extent of it. One time, we were doing an interview together, and the interviewer asked Carl what it was between him and I. And he goes, well, Brian and I don't have a, have a need to talk to each other ever. We just, we, we're, we're just Beach Boys, but we don't have any need to be friends. You know, and that's true. He said it right on the right on the nose. He said it right on the dot, right on the dot. That's the truth. We don't need to be friends. Although, whenever I think about him, I feel rotten and I feel terrible. Brian, I want to ask you about another track on the album called "Baby Let Your Hair Grow Long." How did you put that song together? See, a long time ago, I was sitting at my piano in uh, in an, it was 61 Malibu Colony was my address. And it was like I had, I had a shed outside of the house. It was separate from the house where my piano was. It was my music room, right? right? So I sat down and I came up with the title, Baby Let Your Hair Grow Long. It's a semi-sexual romantic song. and It has um, a lot of goodies, a lot of nice things in the track. And it's like, it's, it's, just, it's the kind of song that somebody would say, God, did you hear that lyric? You know, it's like, it's, it's like a showstopper. Brian, I think that one of your strengths as a producer and as a songwriter is your ability to create and sustain mood. And there's a track on the new album called Nighttime that's very successful in that respect. Well, I thought Nighttime was uh, very descriptive of the dramatic changeover from day to night. For very many people, daytime symbolizes work and it symbolizes tension and all the uptight things, you know. And nighttime seems to be the, the right time for me, you know. That's why I wrote that song. So uh, the theme is kind of a metaphor for going from a, a tense situation into a more relaxed one. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's like the dramatic changeover from day to night. It's, so, it's very gradual. And if people can't understand those lyrics, then something must be wrong, you know, because it's, it's spelled out in black and white what, what those lyrics mean, and I, I just think they're very special. What do you think uh, Brian Wilson has contributed to American popular music? Uh, love. Probably love. Brian, I want to thank you for taking time with us today for this special session of Timothy White's Rockstars. It's been great talking to you, and it's wonderful to see you in such great shape, both artistically and personally. Thank you very much.